Hello. Thank you very, very, very much for coming. And I'm sure some people will be coming in a bit late. But in order to keep to our timetable, um, we, I'd like to get us started. Uh, I'm Lowell Schnipper. Um, I'm based here at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where I'm the chief of Hemonc and clinical director of the hospital's cancer center. Um, and an active participant in the executive committee of the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. The reason I mention these things as background is because we had the good fortune of being approached by several fellows um, at the uh, DFCI MGH program interested in career paths in global oncology. That's Franklin Wong and Ami Bhatt. And they had the, um, I would say, insight, fortitude, and vision to push a lot of us on the faculty uh, uh, in ways that stimulated our already active or somewhat nascent interests in this area uh, and help crystallize thinking about what we in the Harvard community might be able or willing to do by aggregating our resources, viewing them in some holistic way, and developing a career path for physician scientists interested in the epidemiology clinical care and research related to uh, cancer, uh, to oncologic problems in under-resourced uh, parts of the world. And this is a very, very timely uh, endeavor insofar as the National Cancer Institute, which as many of you know, sponsors much of the cancer research going on in the country and certainly is the sponsor for the Comprehensive Cancer Center program throughout the US. Well, the National Cancer Institute has recently urged its cancer centers to develop global oncology uh, programs as part and parcel of the research and uh, a new a training mission for these centers. So we are, at one and the same time, working in parallel paths to develop or consider how best to develop a career path that might enable um, budding oncologists, be they radiation, surgical, or medical in origin, uh, and um, those interested in e epidemiology to develop advanced training in global oncology. And that's a work in progress. We thought that one of the very best ways to begin to um, interest and in, uh, stimulate our um, academic and clinical communities in this area is to initiate a seminar series. The first was held in November. Paul Farmer was the speaker. <laughs> the, um, it was very, very well attended and enthusiastically received. So this is the second in a series that we hope will be ongoing. Um, the next, I believe, is going to be at Mass General Hospital. Uh, and that will be in several, several months into the future. The theme of today is going to be palliative care in the uh, uh, under-resourced nations of the world. We have an expert, um, uh, Megan O'Brien. There she is, from, uh, from uh, the UICC and the American Cancer Society. Um, and Megan had her roots uh, uh, here in Boston in a previous uh, life, but she is an expert in this area. And we're blessed, of course, having on our own faculty quite a few people who are both experts and activists uh, in this arena. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, encourage Sarah to come on up and make an introduction. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Slater. Uh, some of you know me. I was a, a fellow here at the BI in Hemonk, and I was a palliative care fellow at MGH prior to that. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Eric Krakauer, who has been a mentor to me for several years. Dr. Krakauer has a, an impressive resume, training at Yale and Harvard, and a list of accomplishments and publications that could go on for pages. Um, but I'm going to focus on some of the recent work that he's done, which I think is incredibly uh, important and relevant to today's talk. I first met Eric when I was a fellow, and he was my attending on the palliative care service. And any trainees who have rounded with Eric soon learn that he is a passionate teacher, as well as a tireless and devoted clinician. 
Among the fellows, he is known for rounding late into the night and wanting to know every detail about every patient from their PFTs to the name of the town that they were born in in Russia. And learning the patient's story and how he could help the most, either with medications or by writing a letter to get a patient a visa into the uh, a patient's family member a visa into the country, was always his priority. And on rounds, we would often talk about the burden of human suffering, both here but also in other countries, where resources are so much scarcer. And I soon learned that Eric spent much of his time off service actually traveling around the world and helping to integrate palliative care and pain management into healthcare systems with, in, low and, in low and middle income countries. Um, his work first began after a trip that he made to Vietnam in 1998, where he had the opportunity to visit a hospital. Um, and he saw that there was a huge unmet need in caring for patients who are suffering from end stage uh, HIV and AIDS. And after that visit, he began to return to Vietnam on a regular basis, volunteering his time, uh, his vacation time, to see patients and to teach physicians there about the management of HIV and AIDS, opportunistic infections, and um, also pain and symptom management at the end of life. And in 2001, he founded the Vietnam CDC HMS AIDS Partnership to provide training and technical assistance uh, in HIV AIDS treatment to Vietnam's physicians and nurses. Um, in recent years, Eric's work has also focused on bringing palliative care to patients living with cancer as well. And in Vietnam, uh, over 150,000 patients each year are diagnosed with cancer, and over 80% of those patients are diagnosed with advanced stage cancer. Um, as we discussed at the last uh, global oncology session, uh, the World Health Organization has guidelines for cancer care uh, globally, which include prevention, um, surveillance and screening, early detection and curative treatment if possible, but also um, palliative care for patients with advanced uh, cancer. And so based on the recommendations from the World Health Organization, in 2005, the Vietnamese Ministry of Health performed a rapid situation analysis to assess palliative care needs of patients in Vietnam. And they identified a very high level of unmet need for pain and symptom control, psychosocial support, and training for clinicians. And Eric's subsequent work in Vietnam has involved assisting the Ministry of Health, uh, major cancer centers, and general hospitals throughout the country to develop guidelines for pain management and palliative care. He has focused on trying to break down many barriers uh, to palliative care, including lack of accessibility to essential medications, the strict regulations that control those medications, and the need to educate uh, clinicians about palliative medicine. Eric has co-authored basic, advanced, and specialty training curricula in palliative <coughs> medicine, and he has personally overseen the training of hundreds of Vietnamese clinicians in palliative care. Um, he, he has worked to establish centers of ongoing sustainable education in Vietnam, in the last four years, he's been working very closely with Ho Chi Minh City Cancer Hospital, which is southern Vietnam's busiest cancer center. And with his support, the hospital has been able to open a department of palliative care, which has included an inpatient ward, an outpatient clinic, home care services, and a palliative care training program. In addition to his ongoing work in Vietnam, Eric has been working with partners in health to integrate palliative care into cancer treatment programs in Rwanda and Malawi. I've had the privilege to teach with Eric in Vietnam on several occasions, and he approaches teaching, teaching and patient care on the other side of glo the globe with the same tireless um, devotion and caring. It turns out that Dr. Eric, as he is called there, is also famous amongst his Vietnamese students for rounding very late into the night. <laughs> And although the lecture days are often long, he always stresses the importance of going to the bedside, of meeting with patients of their, and their families, hearing their stories, um, and bearing witness to the tremendous suffering that exists, suffering that might be easily managed if those patients were being cared for in one of our Boston hospitals. I have tremendous respect for Eric as a clinician and as a humanitarian and what he's, for what he's been able to accomplish in the past decade. Um, 
although he will be the first to tell you that there's still so much more to be done. So, Eric. Thank you, Sarah, um, for those very sweet lies. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, actually, you saved me some time because I don't need to go through some of the things that you mentioned. But uh, thank you so much, and thanks to the organizers of this uh, Global Oncology Initiative, which I think is so important and so needed. Um, let's see. Now I have to work the technology. The other one? Ah, okay. Um, uh, this is the, the busiest slide. Um, uh, we can move on from there. So in the next half hour or so, um, I propose to ask a few questions. I have a lot more questions than, than answers. Um, first, what is palliative care? There's a lot of confusion about that, which I think is impeding the field. Uh, should it be different in rich and poor countries? Short answer is yes. Um, what are the major barriers? to palliative care in poor countries and how to overcome them? Why is pain relief particularly so difficult to make accessible for the poor? And what are some examples of some places where some of these barriers, at least, are being overcome? Uh, that should only take about 30 minutes or so. So um, this is a pretty basic question. I realize that. But um, I think it's an important place to start. What is the goal of medicine? What are we doing here? And I think that um, some of these answers might be the, the most common ones. Save lives, cure diseases, prevent diseases, um, do research um, to realize the Cartesian dream of, of mastering, um, uh, if not the body, then at least pathophysiology. But I think there's something more basic than all these things. And all these things are in the service of something else. Um, and I think one can read this in Eric Cassell's work, um, which I recommend if you don't know it. Uh, medicine's basic tasks are relief of suffering and care of the sick. Relief of suffering, of, of suffering human beings. That's, I think, what we're doing here. And all that other stuff is, uh, is, is what we do toward that end. But I think as medicine has gotten more technological and um, focused more on curing diseases and replacing organs and manipulating molecules, it's forgotten a bit about relieving suffering, suffering of human beings. That's why palliative care became necessary. That's how I understand it anyway. That's why this field developed. Cassell's, or based on Cassell's, I think a contemporary medicine fails in a lot of ways to respond to suffering. Neglect of pain, neglect of the dying. Uh, this has improved in our country, at least in, in, uh, in, in recent decades, but still is not adequate. Certainly neglect of marginal and vulnerable populations, injudicious use of life-sustaining treatments, and then failure to assist colleagues uh, LMIC, low and middle income countries. I'll try to uh, explain all the acronyms. Failure to assist colleagues in low and middle income countries to develop sustainable and accessible health care. I think this is why palliative care became necessary. So I understand palliative care as an attempt to restore to medicine its, its forgotten essence, the relief of suffering, and it does that it responds to and relieves suffering of any kind, physical, psychological, social, and spiritual. That's, and that's per the WHO definition, which you'll hear in a minute that I don't like very much for other reasons. So what are these barriers that are so difficult to overcome? Uh, I've summarized them here. So misunderstandings of palliative care. Lack of understanding of the need for palliative care, and it's very, very common everywhere, including in developing countries. 
lack of national palliative care policies and guidelines, inaccessibility of essential medicines, especially opioids, and among the opioids, especially oral immediate release uh, morphine, opiophobia, which I'll explain a little bit later, um, lack of clinicians trained in palliative care, and lack of palliative care services. And I'll go through each one of these. The first one, misunderstandings. So there's really confusing definitions of, of palliative care. PEPFAR, that acronym stands for President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. It was what George Bush announced at his State of the Union address in 2003, I think. Um, the US government's uh, um, program to treat AIDS in the developing world. And they defined palliative care as everything other than antiretroviral therapy. Well, why not include antiretroviral therapy? I mean, that's, it's not curative, um, so it's palliative in a way. That did two, one really good thing and one really bad thing. It put palliative care on the radar screens of ministries of health around the world. That's the good thing. And it confused the hell out of everybody. That's the bad thing. Um, so what the hell is palliative care? Um, the WHO definition. This was really written for cancer patients in rich countries, I think. Um, in fact, its uh, uh, colleagues from the WHO have acknowledged as much. It's a fairly long definition, but it says, among other things, that palliative care regards dying as a normal process. Well, pretty much everybody dies. Um, so I guess that's normal. But when you're 18 and dying of AIDS because you don't have access to, to what's taken for granted in rich countries, or dying of an easily preventable, diagnosable, and treatable cancer because you're poor, I don't call that normal. And I don't think we should consider it normal. It's abnormal. The WHO definition also says that palliative care intends neither to hasten or postpone death. Again, when you're a young person dying of a preventable and treatable disease because you're too poor to afford the prevention and the treatment, I think we should be doing everything we can as palliative care clinicians to, uh, to try to postpone the death and, and get treatment and, and cure. I don't see that as incompatible with palliative care. In fact, I think it needs to be part of it. Then there are some confusing statements by some of my most beloved colleagues who really are very well intentioned, um, but things come out like palliative care is the only feasible and humane response to AIDS in the poorest settings. This makes me crazy, um, and, um, uh, and, and I hope it does you as well. I think what's meant is that well, in places where they're not antiretrovirals yet um, and people are dying, we need to, to, to make sure that people are not suffering unnecessarily. And yes, everybody should have access to pain relief and palliative care. But just because it's hard to do antiretroviral therapy or it's hard to treat cancer or it's hard to, to, to diagnose or treat whatever doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. And thank God that Partners in Health has shown that even when things seem really difficult, really expensive, and hard to, to implement, they can be done, like treating HIV uh, in the poorest settings, treating multi-drug uh, resistant tuberculosis in the poorest settings, treating cancer in the poorest settings. So it's not the only feasible and humane response. It needs to be part of it. And then mistrust of palliative care, and I think this is provoked to some extent by those kind of well-intentioned but misguided statements. So we hear things like um, palliative care is second-rate care for the poor. Well, if you hear that kind of statement that it's the only feasible and humane response, you can understand why people say that. So what to do about this? Well, I think the WHO definition needs to be, uh, needs to be changed. I've written about this a bit. Um, uh, what I've found is that um, you can actually do this, but you need to uh, raise enough money for the WHO to set up a committee um, to 
to study the problem and then do what they do and, 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 and revise their definition, and that hasn't been done yet. But I think the definition needs to be changed to emphasize that pain and symptom relief and psychosocial support for patients and families are essential parts of comprehensive, emphasize comprehensive care for cancer, HIV, AIDS, and non-communicable non uh, diseases, beginning at the time of diagnosis. At the time of diagnosis of a, of a severe or serious or life-threatening illness, that's at least a good point for the initial palliative care assessment to see if, their needs, uh, if needs are there. And palliative care should promote access and adherence to preventive, curative, and disease-modifying therapies, such as the ones I've listed here. If patients don't have access to those things, and I'm a palliative care provider in a very poor setting, then I think it, it, it behooves me, it's a, it's a moral obligation, to try to promote access to what can, can, can prevent disease and, and, and uh, cure a, uh, a curable illness, not just help people die with less pain. So I see no dichotomy between palliative and disease-modifying interventions for cancer patients or for AIDS patients or for non-communicable disease patients. For example, palliative care, so like symptom relief, psychosocial support, can improve adherence to and access to cancer treatment um, and, uh, and, and thereby maybe even reduce mortality. And I'm gonna mention a study that probably most of you already know about where this was actually shown, that palliative care has a mortality benefit in some situations. On the other hand, cancer chemotherapy and radiation therapy often is not curative, but can relieve pain and other symptoms. So, does that, so that means that's palliative, whereas on the other hand, palliative care can, can have a mortality benefit and maybe even in some cases promote cure. So really there's, there's, there's no clear separation between palliative care and disease modifying treatment in my mind. On the contrary, contrary to what people say about palliative care being second rate care for the poor, I think that cancer care or HIV AIDS care or non-communicable disease care that doesn't include palliative care, that's second rate. We need to be attending to human suffering, not just diseases. We need to be treating pain. We need to be treating psychosocial distress, spiritual distress. That should be part of comprehensive cancer, HIV, non-communicable disease care. And um, there are those who've, who've written quite eloquently, I think, about palliative care as a human right. So this is the study uh, led by Jen Temple and a um, uh, lot of colleagues from my service at Mass General. Uh, I was out running around the world, so they didn't include me. I felt very upset. Um, now this is really, really a watershed study in, in, uh, in palliative care. Um, patients with, uh, at the time of diagnosis of metastatic non-small cell uh, lung cancer were randomized to, uh, a, uh, to receive immediate palliative care or usual care. Immediate palliative care meant that they would see us, the palliative care service, at least once a month when they came to see their oncologist. Our, our clinics are right next to each other. And when they get uh, admitted to the inpatient service, we'd see them in the hospital. Is that, am I getting this right? Um, and usual care meant that they might get a palliative care referral sometime in the course of their illness, usually at the very end of life, in the last days, uh, or maybe not at all. And um, the uh, outcome was that the patients with the early palliative care intervention had significantly less depression, uh, better quality of life, less use of aggressive life-sustaining treatments, and a mortality benefit of almost three months. They lived longer than the other group. Am I, getting, am I making this up? Okay. Um, so we don't know exactly why that is, but palliative care, at least for patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer at Mass General, has a mortality benefit. Keep tuned in, we'll, we're trying to figure out why. 
So this is Mr. Duke. And Mr. Duke wanted me to uh, introduce him to everybody around the world um, and use his name and use his picture because I think he kind of uh, uh, exemplifies what palliative care can do. Mr. Duke was sent to an AIDS hospice uh, in about 2004 or so, 2005 maybe, to die from a hospital. His sputum was um, AFB negative, he had advanced AIDS. You could see he had massive ascites. He was hep C positive and they thought he had cirrhosis and they thought his ascites was um, because of the portal hypertension. And he was AFB, uh, his sputum was AFB negative. So he was sent to die of his uh, end stage liver disease and end stage AIDS. And he was in a lot of pain. His, his, his abdomen was like a drum, it was very tense. So um, I, I used to go out to this hospice on weekends um, and they'd always ask me to see the sickest patients. And um, so they asked me to see him. We gave him one dose of, of uh, opioid, I guess it was morphine. Uh, and then I sat and I scrounged together some tubing and needle and, and spent the evening with Mr. Duke uh, taking fluid out of his belly because we didn't have any vacuum bottles. So it's just, you know, you gotta sit for a while. So Mr. Duke was telling me his life story. You, you can't really tell very well, but um, the nurse here is laughing behind the mask because I think Mr. Duke is telling me here that when he gets better, he's going to find me a wife. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, how am I going to explain that to my wife? Yeah. <laughs> but I thought it was very kind anyway, a very nice offer. Um, anyway, took out some fluid out of his belly, felt much better, obviously. Given his symptoms, we started him on um, uh, anti-TB meds. Um, even though he was deemed to not have TB. And his ascites grew less and less and less and pretty much disappeared by the end of the two-month intensive phase of treatment, which means that it wasn't the cirrhosis that was causing the ascites, he had TB peritonitis. So as he got better, then we started him on antiretroviral therapy, and this is Mr. Duke a year later or so, when he's really not a patient anymore, he's working at the place. He's since reconciled with his family, and uh, gotten married and he lives in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, so uh, palliative care can even do that. It's not just about taking care of the dying. That's Mr. Duke. The WHO has developed a strategy for developing national palliative care programs uh, and overcoming the barriers that, uh, that I've mentioned and will be going through. And these are the, the, the steps. Establishing a, a, a National Palliative Care Steering Committee, doing a situation analysis of palliative care needs, which are usually enormous, and available services, which are usually minimal. Then, based on this situation analysis, developing a national palliative care policies and guidelines, assuring essential palliative medicine availability, especially oral immediate release morphine, training, education, not only for clinicians, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, uh, community health workers, but also for healthcare officials, because they've got to get it or otherwise they won't allow anything to happen. And then implementation of palliative care services. And this is the, the, the relatively simple roadmap that we've been trying to follow in various countries. Uh, Frank Ferris and some colleagues uh, like umbrellas, so they made this, uh, this little cartoon of, of, of those four parts, policy, drug availability, education, and implementation. Barrier number two, lack of awareness of the need for palliative care. Often healthcare officials and clinicians don't recognize the scale of suffering due to pain and other physical symptoms and psychosocial distress. Or they think, I already take care of that. I already, I don't, my patients are already well taken care of. We don't need somebody else telling us, telling me how to take care of my patients. We're already doing that. We're doing fine. Ask my patients, they're doing fine. Well, maybe not so much. So the situation analysis is really important to, to show what the needs really are. And when we did it in Vietnam, we found enormous needs. Patients with cancer and, and, and AIDS, more than 80, 85% reported significant pain 
and lots of psychosocial distress and other symptoms. Situation analyses can be, uh, can be done on a large scale. So in Vietnam, we did it in five provinces nationwide, rural and urban, um, north and south, or it can be done very small scale. So as I speak, uh, a situation analysis is going on in one rural district in Malawi where Partners in Health works, to, uh, 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 led by a Harvard medical student, Shakina Elmore. Um, and uh, now some residents from the Brigham's um, Global Health Equity Residency Program. Uh, that's just in one district in Malawi. It can even be done just in one clinic or hospital. Uh, the survey instruments for this kind of situation analysis are available. Nobody needs to reinvent the wheel. We're using, uh, among other things, the, the uh, African Palliative Care Association's Palliative Outcome Scale, Brief Pain Inventory. There's various uh, instruments that can be used for this, and the results should be published or circulated to add to the, the database uh, palliative care. There's not much published about palliative care in developing countries. Third barrier, lack of national guidelines. If there's no national guidelines, uh, palliative care is, is not likely to be implemented uh, throughout the country, maybe only here and there. It's probably going to be of uneven quality, um, and it's going to be hard to, to scale it up. So there really need to be national palliative care uh, policies based on the situation analysis, and part of the service that uh, my group offers is to provide technical assistance in developing those policies. We, sometimes we just ghostwrite them. Um, uh, but now that there are several examples, South Africa, Uganda, Vietnam, Malawi, Rwanda, uh, no one needs to reinvent the, the wheel. You can see what others are doing. And also national opioid policies, and I'll get into, uh, into opioids a bit more. Lack of essential medicines. So there's lots of reasons why uh, morphine opioids are not available. There's a lot of fear this opiophobia that I mentioned before. There's lots of fear of opioids, side effects, addiction, and diversion for illicit purposes, especially in countries where there's an illicit drug problem. There's extremely restrictive opioid prescribing regulations around the world that I'll mention more about. There's a lack of financial incentive for importation or local production. And there's a self-perpetuating cycle of low use and demand resulting in limited availability and then low use. So morphine. Been around for millennia. It's sort of an indication of how the sciences of the nervous system are still in their infancy compared to the sciences of all the other organs in the body because we're still using the same drug we've been using for millennia. It's still the best we got, but it's the best we got. It's very effective for moderate or severe pain in most cases. It's actually quite safe. People take opioids, like methadone, for example, for decades. Um, it doesn't screw up your liver like alcohol or your brain. It doesn't screw up your lungs like cigarettes. It's a lot safer than those in many ways. Used in the hospital, it's extremely safe because you can reverse the effects and the side effects are manageable. So I think it's really quite a safe drug. It's incredibly cheap. This is one of the problems. It's too cheap. There's no profit incentive for the drug companies. It it's, can cost less than 1% per dose. Five milligrams of oral morphine, less than one cent. The WHO, the World Health Organization, says it's indispensable for treating moderate and severe pain, and it's on the WHO model list of essential medicines, both injectable and oral. What else does the, the world body say about morphine? The UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights says that as part of the right to the highest attainable standard of health, morphine must be both available and accessible, and there's a difference. You can have plenty of drug available in a country, and people still don't have access to it. The rural poor can't have, don't have access to it. It's rotting in a warehouse somewhere. No one prescribes it. People can't get to the city to, to, uh, to, to pick it up. So it needs to be both available and accessible to everyone in need, especially the most vulnerable and marginal. And this also requires that their conditions be trained in the use. 
The UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading Treatment in 2009 wrote this. The de facto denial of access to pain relief if it causes severe pain and suffering constitutes torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. There's a lot of consensus that this needs to be that pain relief uh, and palliative care, but especially pain relief, is a human right and everybody should have access to it. So how are we doing? Pretty well, right? It should be pretty easy. It's so cheap. Well, five-sixths of the world population doesn't have access to it. And guess which five-sixths? The bottom five billion don't have access to it. So the result is that each year millions of people suffer in pain unnecessarily. 5.5 million terminal cancer patients. Tens of millions of, of others, people with chronic diseases like organ failure, AIDS, post-operative patients. In Vietnam and in many countries, the typical post-op med, and I'm talking about for even major surgery, is intravenous acetaminophen or paracetamol, not opioid. Trauma patients. Basically, the rich have access and the poor don't. So in the 120 or so poorest countries of the world, it's hardly available. And even in the US, the poor and ethnic minorities lack equal access to good analgesia. And happy to give you references. This has been studied. A couple of graphic uh, presentations of this. So on the left here is high income countries. It's only 17% of the population of the world lives in high income countries, they use 91% of the opioids, of the morphine. <coughs> Doesn't seem right. Low and middle income countries, 83% of the world's population, they get 9% of the world's opioids. A uh, little hard to see on the back, um, but this shows really the same thing. So this is, um, uh, global consumption of, of, uh, of morphine um, and on the left here where there's a lot of uh, uh, morphine consumed, the highest consuming countries, Austria, the US, all the, all the rich countries, and then the rest of the world uses hardly any. Um, those, those two slides were data from 2008. Just to show you the trend, so use of opioids is going up. Um, that's good, right? Pain is getting better treated. Well, it turns out it's basically going up because it's going up in high income countries. The blue is high income countries. Low and middle income countries is the red down here. Not a whole lot happening. So why is it that pain relief is not accessible to the bottom five billion when it's Effective, safe, cheap, and easy to use. Why is this? Seems kind of hard to understand. It is, I think Meg O'Brien and, and I wonder about this all the time ourselves. Um, it's, 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 it's hard to understand. So here is, how are we doing for time? Okay. Um, I'll just, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go through uh, some of this stuff kind of quickly. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting history, I think. Um, okay, yeah. So a lot of people talk about abuse of opioids by individuals. I've come to understand that some of the worst, by far the worst abuse of opioids is by governments, has been by governments and, and probably still is. In the colonial era, selling opium was a major source of revenue. It basically funded uh, colonial empires. In the 17th century, the European colonial powers began shipping opium from India to, to Asia, China and Southeast Asia, and used the tax revenue to finance their colonial governments. Um, in the late 18th century, the British East India Company asserted a monopoly over the trade to, to China. Now, uh, England wanted the tea in China, and the Chinese said, fine, pay us. And England said, no, but we'll give you opium. Um, and the, the Chinese emperor said, no, we don't really want opium, thank you very much. And so England did the obvious thing. They invaded China. 
They launched the opium wars. You know, it's not, they can't say they don't want opium. They can't say they want money for their tea. So British launched the opium wars, humiliated China, ra raped and pillaged, um, and profoundly humiliated China. This is a really big deal. Uh, my wife's Chinese, and uh, uh, anyone in the room who is will, will, will probably know about this. Um, and by 1900, it's been, it's been uh, written in histories that there were 13 million opium addicts in China, 3% of the population. The British were basically actively trying to get people to use opiates and to be addicted. Um, the French did the same in, in Vietnam, in Indochina. They even had village quotas for how much each village had to buy. Um, and then they used the tax, uh, the, 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 they tax it and use the money to run their government. So you can understand why there's some, some antipathy toward opioids. You maybe also can understand why when another white guy arrives and says, you guys should be using more opioids, there might be some un unease about that. Um, but um, people are incredibly welcoming and, and, and understanding. In the West, opioids were, were commonly used as remedies for just about anything in the, in the 18th century. Then the um, prohibition movements got going, um, a lot of them sort of religious-based, um, including you know, prohibition of alcohol, but uh, also prohibition of opioids, uh, when it was recognized that opioid, opi opioids had addictive potential. And this led to uh, prohibition of opioids in the West and in colonies where the colonial powers weren't actively trying to get people addicted. And these extremely restrictive laws and regulations uh, have remained on the books in many countries, especially in former colonies. So for example, in India, they've remained on the books until this day. In Bangladesh, they got rid of them. Um, and India is just trying to, to, to break, get rid of those, those, uh, those old British laws um, uh, now. And th the same is true in, in some African countries. In South and Central America, I think it's the war on drugs that's generated similarly opiophobic laws. Um, there's been, um, in Vietnam, um, now there's a lot of uh, heroin coming in from the Golden Triangle, that, uh, and there's, there's injection uh, drug use that's driving the HIV epidemic. There's other, uh, other um, ways in which opioids are being trafficked uh, with support by even the United States government, the CIA. I won't go into details. I, uh, if anyone's interested, Alfred McCoy, a historian at, um, I think at uh, Wisconsin, has written extensively on this. But for lack of time, I'm going to go on. The consequences of this fear of opioids is, is highly restrictive laws and regulations. Um, a, a vicious circle where there's low consumption. Every year, according to an, an international treaty that everybody has signed, Every country has to report opioid consumption to a UN body called the International Narcotics Control Board that sits in Vienna. And they have to say, they estimate how much opioid they need for the coming year. So they have low consumption, they have a low estimate, the, the INCB uh, allocates therefore a very little amount of opioid, which means that, that that country can then only produce or import as much as been approved by the INCB, and so there's not much around, so there's low consumption. And this goes around and around and around. Clinicians um, lack training in, in, in pain and, and opioid analgesia because people don't want to talk about it. They're afraid of addiction and adverse effects. They, they're afraid that their bosses or even the police might not like it if they prescribe opioids, so they don't do it. Pharmacists don't stock it. Even patients are afraid of it. This business about op uh, morphine being so inexpensive, so there's very low profit margins. So the drug companies don't even want to pay the licensing costs to get the drug, to get morphine into countries. Um, and so it's really, it's, uh, uh, it's really not even available. It's hard to get on the international market. The drug companies want to sell expensive preparations that patients can't afford. And this is the result. Pain, all unnecessary pain, all over the world. The solutions are somewhat complex, but extremely necessary. 
So a lot of uh, what I've been working on for the last several years, working with uh, a group called the Pain and Policy Studies Group at the University of Wisconsin Cancer Center, is assisting certain low and middle income countries to analyze their national opioid laws and regulations, um, find uh, how the barriers can be reduced. Also educating healthcare officials on, uh, on opioids, again using materials from this group at the University of Wisconsin, assisting low and middle income countries to revise their policies um, and to obtain morphine and create a secure supply chain and then training clinicians, which is uh, also a lot of what we, what, what we do and what uh, Meg and Sarah do as well now, very well in Vietnam. So we've been, uh, as Sarah mentioned, we've developed uh, curricula to train physicians and train quite a number of people. There's lots of demand for it, so we're always, we're always scurrying to try to, to meet the demand and to help our local colleagues um, become trainers themselves. And there's lots of curricula out there. For anyone who wants to do this, we have a curriculum that we developed here. Uh, it's been approved by the Ministry of Health in Vietnam. We've adapted it for Malawi. We've adapted it for multi-drug resistant TB. It's been translated into Russian. Um, uh, and there's other curricula as well. So no need to reinvent the wheel. And finally, lack of palliative care services. In inpatient and community-based services typically aren't available. And this requires political leadership to, uh, to create these services. Um, in the community, most patients around the world die at home. They want to be at home, and there's no room in the hospitals anyway. So this, I think, requires um, uh, home care, and community health workers are or will be an essential part of this. Partners in Health's model of, of uh, community health workers or accompagnateur, um, which has worked very well for bringing uh, TB treatment and uh, HIV treatment to the poorest settings, can also be adapted for providing palliative care. The community health workers can at very least be the eyes and ears of clinicians uh, at district level or at uh, communal health stations and recognize people in trouble and organize uh, ways to, um, to, to help them. So uh, for lack of time, I won't go through what's been done in Vietnam. We've basically gone through all these steps. Um, and um, I think with, with injection of adequate funding and, and training and technical assistance, Vietnam could probably have sustainable palliative care throughout the country, um, not f accessible by everyone, but growing um, within about five years. Um, these are some of the documents that we've developed for Vietnam. In Malawi, uh, I think uh, the, Malawi is in some ways the, the, the most advanced of the Part PIH sites in terms of integrating palliative care. Um, a palliative care team is fully integrated with the cancer care program. All the patients who, uh, who are treated for cancer also see the palliative care people and the uh, six to 700 community health workers in this one district are, are receiving training in uh, basic palliative care uh, so that they'll be the eyes and ears of, of the team. And this is, I think, very exciting. It's what palliative care needs to be like worldwide, not off on its own, but integrated with um, uh, disease prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. These are just a couple photos uh, from, uh, from Malawi of uh, what we're dealing with a lot, patients with Kaposi sarcoma, KS, is the most prevalent cancer among uh, adult uh, males, second most common after cervical cancer in women. Um, and we don't see much anymore in this country because of antiretroviral therapy. These are KS lesions uh, and a particularly large one on this patient's tongue. This is uh, the palliative care team um, in a village, seeing a lady who uh, was, uh, had end-stage cancer, um, uh, Dr. Noel Kalanga, uh, seeing her, and that's a physical therapist standing, standing above her because uh, she needed some help with walking. I think we had a wheelchair for her on that day. Uh, I should, I should uh, mention that the social supports uh, that Partners in Health does are state-of-the-art, underfunded, but uh, really impressive, really amazing 
they, they are better than really any palliative care program I've seen in, in the developing country. So uh, I don't want to uh, stop without thanking a lot of people, thanking all of our funders over the years um, who I've mentioned here, um, and some I didn't mention because I didn't want to mention our colleagues in Vietnam, especially at the Ministry of Health, the Pain and Policy Studies Group. Um, here at Harvard, uh, uh, Dr. Larry Schulman has been incredibly supportive and, and, and the leader in the, the overall cancer uh, uh, project for treating cancer in the poor settings. Uh, including palliative care, Jean Buchman, the folks in, in Rwanda, Dr. Jonas, Dr. Noel, Jason, and, and Michael, and, and many others. And I, I also really want to thank the, the uh, Global Oncology Initiative leaders, uh, Amy Bott and Franklin uh, Huang um, and Pallavi Kumar, uh, Mary Ju, where are you up there? Um, it, it's wonderful what you're doing, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I just want to mention that just yesterday uh, I heard about a wonderful new collaboration. Professor, Professor Felicia Knoll of Harvard has secured a grant through the Fundación Mexicana para Salud to develop and implement uh, training materials in pain and, pal and palliation for two countries, Mexico and Uganda. Um, so um, important step forward. Um, and I will stop there and happy to, to, to uh, take any comments, complaints, suggestions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Lee. I'm one of the fellows here at Beth Israel, and I helped to organize the event. I think we have a little bit of time to um, open up the forum to a, for some questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> we have a microphone. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Hutton. I'm a fourth year medicine pediatrics resident at Brigham and Children's. And I was really interested in the first point you had on your slide, the argument that um, palliative care programs in rich versus low and middle income countries should be different. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that point. Sure. Um, you know, I think that um, in rich countries, we should be able to assume that everyone has access to disease prevention, early diagnosis, and treatment. It's maybe more true in other rich countries than this rich country, but uh, we should be able to assume that. To, uh, we can't assume that in, in, in poor countries. So uh, I th absolutely think that nobody should, should, should have to be in, in pain uh, without treatment. Nobody should be without pain relief and palliative care. But if I go to Malawi, um, and start a hospice and just start taking care of dying patients, well, that's, that's needed, uh, it's important, but if that's not a part of trying to, to, to improve access to disease prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, is that providing second-rate care for the poor? I think that argument can be made. And you know, I don't mean to uh, demean in any way the incredible work that, that for example, a Foundation for Hospices in Sub-Saharan Africa and other organizations are doing. But I think that our efforts to, to, to make pain relief and palliative care available in poor settings needs to be associated with more comprehensive care, including efforts to make disease prevention diagnosis, and treatment available. And that's why I'm so excited about working with Partners in Health, which is you know, trying to provide comprehensive cancer care in the poorest settings, and in Vietnam, why I'm so excited about working with the, the cancer centers, uh, which are also providing comprehensive cancer care, and the HIV centers. Uh, I think that that collaboration, that linkage, is so important. So I think we have maybe time for Couple more questions. Thank you. Eric, um, the goals of palliative care, as you uh, beautifully articulated, are really, in my mind, the goals of medicine. <laughs> so I understand that here, it's really important to cultivate a, a 
cohort of experts in pain and symptom management and advocate for models of integration. But as we're thinking about exporting this to resource poor countries, isn't your message that we should really be promoting good medicine across the board? Yes, <laughs> sure, <laughs> in short. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you know, I, that sounds that seems very simple. But you know, I, 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 you know, I really feel for our colleagues in 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 developing countries. So, for example, at the Ho Chi Minh City Cancer Center, where Sarah and Kathleen and I work a lot, it's extremely busy and extremely crowded. I mean, extremely. So you'll see 50 outpatients. You think, you know, we think we're busy with our 10 or 12 uh, outpatients in a half day. Try 50. And then you see your 15 inpatients who are really, really sick. And some of them, you know, ha are sharing a bed with two other patients, so there's no privacy. So implementing all this stuff in, in, uh, in, in resource-poor settings isn't easy. So it's very easy to go and say that, you know, this should all be part of comprehensive care. It's, it's harder. To, to actually make it happen. And I think that I need to be very careful to, to not come and arrogantly say what you should be doing in a developing country um, because uh, you know, it's, it's, not easy to, to, it's not easy to do these things. And there's all kinds of barriers, different ones in different places that need to be overcome. But yeah, absolutely, it's just, it's just good medicine. Go ahead. Oh. Well, I had a quick question about um, the stigma associated with the diagnosis, independent of the use of opioids. And I wondered if that was part of or something you've considered in other cultures. You, you sort of mentioned it in the patient that you showed us whose family sort of didn't want to deal with it. Or I'm sure that there was an element to that as well. They didn't want other people to find out that this mm -hmm. was going on. And is that a part of global cancer care that maybe we don't Direct. It kind of comes to cultural sensitivity about not telling other people how they should be, but at the same time, how do you address these issues if people don't want to let other people find out? Yeah, that's, that's so. The question was about stigmatization. Uh, it's it's worse for HIV and probably also TB, or and certainly HIV and TB than for cancer, but it exists with cancer as well. Um, so yeah, this this needs to be. This, one needs to be sensitive to this. So, uh, for example, many patients with AIDS don't want us, uh, don't want people coming to the house um, uh, to even to provide antiretroviral therapy or provide directly observed therapy. They want to do that some other place. They don't want it to be obvious that there's somebody really sick there. They might not, people might not know that they have advanced AIDS or, or cancer. So this, yeah, this needs, to be, this needs to be figured out. I would go beyond that to say that I think we have a responsibility uh, where there is stigmatization as palliative care uh, clinicians to, to do something about that, to try to uh, advocate for, for people with cancer, people with AIDS, and to try to fight the stigmatization. Because stigmatization, I think, is sometimes as harmful or more harmful than the disease itself. Um, so I think that's, and, and as I said earlier on, palliative care is a response to suffering. People are suffering because they're stigmatized. We need to be doing something about that. So I think, that, I think stigmatization is really important and needs to be recognized. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Dr. Schnipper. Just, Dr. Schnipper. Just, um, given the enormous need that you're describing, both for palliative care but also for disease prevention and intervention, that's disease specific, in under-resourced countries, those that you've been working with, is there an intense competition for the scarce resources that are extant? And if so, how does that get adjudicated? <laughs> that's a really good question, <laughs> yes. Um, well, there's just nowhere near enough resources. Um, and um, I mean, I think, Larry, you could speak to this because you know, you've been very successful at, at at finding resources, uh, but it's hard. Um, we try not to compete with you know, colleagues who are, do, who are doing the same thing, but the number of people who fund palliative care in developing countries is very small. 
and one foundation, the Diana Princess of Wales Memorial Fund, went out of business in 2012. Um, Atlantic Philanthropies supported us. They, they've left Vietnam. They're, they're out of the business. It's, it's very difficult. Um, there's lots of important uh, um, uh, projects to give money to, but um, uh, you know, all I can say is we're constantly trying to find new sources, uh, generate interest, find new donors, interest foundations, and, and maybe Larry could uh, say more about that. Yeah, so you know, I'm not an economist, as you know. Um, <laughs> But you know, Paul Farmer always makes the uh, argument that in the case of prevention and treatment, they're not mutually exclusive, and it shouldn't be an either or or a rivalry between them. And the, the case that he's used has been HIV, on uh, the use of uh, both preventive methods and antiretroviral therapy, and it's been able to make the economic case for this. And people have tried to do this, for instance, with cancer as well. That you know, ultimately to cure a four-year-old with Burkitt's lymphoma and to palliate the child uh, when they're sick uh, and in pain ultimately is an economic benefit to the country and pays dividends back many times over. It's a little bit hard sometimes to carry that argument to the um, financial minister of the country, but that's the approach that we've tried to take is that this is not an either or, it's not a competition between one type of therapy or another, prevention and treatment or treatment and palliative care, and we should get away from the either or argument. Can I just maybe add to that uh, that, um, uh, you know, what, right now in Vietnam, health insurance doesn't cover home care. We think that if patients got home care with community health, mainly with community health workers, which wouldn't cost much, it might save money for the health care system because people won't be going to the central level hospitals from all over the country, which is a big drain in many ways. But you know, we need help from economists to, to, to do costing studies and to generate that kind of data. So um, it's, it's difficult, complicated, but we're working on it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Krakauer. Thank that you. was an excellent, I think, introduction to uh, palliative care in resource limited settings. and. Um, I particularly enjoyed hearing about the barriers um, to care in these, these areas and parts of the world where some of us haven't had experience, and so I appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge. Um, so my name is Brittany Lee. I'm a fellow here at Beth Israel, and I helped to organize this talk today with Pallavi Kumar. And we just have a few, few announcements to make before we close this se segment of the talk, and we have two breakout sessions after this. I first want to thank though um, Dr. Schnipper for hosting this event here at Beth Israel and being a big supporter to global oncology issues. I know that he is involved in a project looking at um, cervical cancer control and will be traveling to Zimbabwe. So I really um, am looking forward to hearing about that trip and your involvement in those efforts going forward in the future. I also want to thank everyone here at Beth Israel who was instrumental in organizing this event. And so that I don't forget anyone's names, I have a list here. I want to thank Susan Magerman, Simona and Sarah in the HEMOC office, Peter McCauley from the media team, Karen Ginsberg, Tessa Neven from Service Response. And then up next, we have two breakout sessions. And I want to thank all the leaders of those sessions. I want to say thank Dr. Krakauer, Kathleen Doyle, Sarah Slater, and Jonathan Jackson. And then I also want to have a special thanks to all the GO volunteers. So Yulia, Ali, Mary, Anna, Theodora, Linka, and Dagny, thank you for your help today. And then without you guys, of course, like this would not have happened. I also want to thank um, the GO steering committee. I want to thank, of course, Amy and Franklin. And um, up next, we have two breakout sessions. I'm going to let um, Pallavi talk a little bit about that. Um, so you probably saw, I'm Paul Levy, by the way, I'm one of the second year fellows at the Dana-Farber uh, MGH Combined Program. Thank you all so much for coming and thanks to Dr. Krakauer again. Um, so our two breakout sessions are actually going to be up in Shapiro 5A and 10. One is going to be focusing on access to opioids, as we heard from Dr. Krakauer, a really central issue. Um, and sort of access to global palliative care. And doctors Sarah Slater and Kathleen Doyle are gonna be leading that one. Um, we will have uh, volunteers escorting people up to that room. And even if you didn't sign up, feel free to come. There's plenty of space and we'd love to have you. The goal is to really engage in an interactive discussion and um, 
uh, have, have a more sort of interactive discussion about these issues. The other um, breakout session is uh, focused on building community um, health partnerships with community health workers in rural settings specifically. And our two leaders there are Dr. Eric Krakauer and Jonathan Jackson, who is um, the CEO and founder of Demaji Inc., which is a, um, a consulting software company which helps to devise kind of innovative um, solutions using mobile health technology. So um, I think they're going to be fantastic. Um, it doesn't matter if you signed up for one or the other. You can go to whichever one you would like to. Um, uh, very importantly, there are snacks in the back, and we would really like people to pick up the bagged snacks on their way to the um, the sessions because I know it's you know it's sort of a long evening, so we want you to be refreshed. A um, couple of things that I just wanted to mention: this entire talk, like we mentioned, was put together by Go Volunteers. So please visit the website um, if you would like to or help organize a talk or volunteer your efforts in any way. Um, and just quickly to run through sort of the very nascent the um, the Go Palliative Care Initiative, which is in its infancy, we're just sort of thinking about ways to um, contribute in this field. So one of our three big goals, and you know, we're really sort of developing this, um, are to assess and promote understanding within the Harvard community and broader um, of palliative care needs in resource poor settings, whether they are here at home um, in places like um, Native American reservations or uh, you know, across the world. Um, the second is really to kind of raise the visibility of these uh, great unmet needs through education and advocacy, and hopefully under the guidance of uh, leaders in the field like Dr. Krakauer to establish a Harvard-wide center for global palliative care where people who are interested across disciplines and at all levels of training can have access to the training that they would need to kind of go and work in these settings. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, and then also a plug for the next Go Talk, which is going to be on March 28th at MGH. It's going to be given by Julie Livingston, who is on faculty at Rutgers. She's a, an associate professor of history, and she's going to talk about sort of cancer as the next emerging epidemic uh, after decades of focus on HIV. So I think that's going to be a fantastic talk um, in coming up in a couple of months, and you'll hear a lot more about that coming up. Um, so importantly, directions <laughs> to the, the breakout sessions. So I think uh, you can do one of two things. You can take the stairs, which are right out here, up to Shapiro 2, uh, I'm sorry, to the second floor, go over to the Shapiro Pavilion, take the elevators up to either 5 or 10. Um, as you can see, 5 is access to opioids and 10 is the other uh, building community partnerships workshop, or you can take the lobby elevators up to 2 and walk across to Shapiro. So thank you all again for thank coming. Thank you for coming.